And welcome back to Anne of Green Gables, Chapter 3. Marilla Cuthbert is surprised. So our words are luminous, wretchedly, dialogue, animation, depreciationly, tragical, rusty, and mellowed. Uh, fiddlesticks, reconcile, distinctly, reproachfully. Meekly preserve depths of despair, gable. Matron, consolation, whitewashed. Rigidity, rigidity. Raiment, temp temptuously prim, pre um, retribution. Uh, set her face against pretty kettle of fish, wrathfully, wrathfully predilection. Ah. Precise, bewitched, dispatched, and resolutely. Your questions are, uh, why does Anne burst into tears? What does Matthew think they should do with Anne? What do you think they should do with Anne? What are at least two examples of idioms from this chapter and what do they mean? And number four, draw the room that Anne slept in her first night at Green Gables. Feel free to label your drawing. The idioms are... Idioms are like an expression that has a different meaning to the meaning of its individual words. So he was on cloud nine. The monster loved just hanging around. So when he's on cloud nine, he liked hanging around. Or um, I might say I was on cloud nine because I was really excited about something. So cloud nine doesn't really mean what it says it means. What? What are all these other ones in here? I'm not going to do other monsters. I'm just going to do the idioms. Uh, cloud nine, well, think about clouds, right? So you're high. If you're on cloud nine, you're really high. All right, you ready? Chapter three, Marilla Cuthbert is surprised. You were on page 22. Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door, but when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress, with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous, or emitting or reflecting light or bright eyes, she stopped short in amazement. Matthew Cuthbert, she, who's that, she ejaculated. Where is the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew wretchedly, which means deeply afflicted, dejected, or distressed in body or mind. There was only her. He nodded at the child, remembering that he had never even asked her name. No boy? But there must have been a boy, insisted Marilla. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't. She brought her. I asked the station master, and, and I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there no matter where the mistake had come in. Well, this is a pretty piece of business, ejaculated Marilla. And mine actually has a picture of what somebody thinks they might look like. I, I have a picture in mine. All right. In the person's head. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what Matthew looks like. Oh, they're not teenagers. Um, They were older. Uh, 60s, that's why they wanted a boy, right? Yeah, so they can he can help with the farming. During this dialogue, 
a conversation between two or more persons. The child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other. All of the animation, so think about uh, cartoons, possessing or characterized by life. All of the animation, oops, sorry. Um, fading out of her face suddenly she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said dropping her precious cargo bag she sprang forward a step and clasped her hands you don't want me she cried you don't want me because I'm not a boy I might have expected it nobody wants nobody ever did want me I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears she did, sitting down on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it, and burying her face in them, she proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other depra uh, depressionally, deprecationally, Tending to belittle someone or something. So they're belittling each other with their eyes, right? Across the stove. Yep, that's question number one. Neither of them knew what to do, say or do. Finally, Marilla stepped lamely and into the breach. So she's coming into the uh, middle of the breach is a space between two things, okay? Well, well, there's there's no need to cry about it. Yes, there is need. The child raised her head, quickly revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. You would cry too if you were an orphan and had to come to a place you thought was going to be home and found out that they didn't want you because you weren't a boy. Oh, this is the most tragical thing that ever happened to me. Regrettably serious or unpleasant. Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty, inept or slow, slow, uh oh, through. Yeah, slow through. S or slow. She, so she's basically, it's, I'm gonna cross off that word. It's an up and slow, so she hasn't, like, smiled in a long time, so she's rusty at smiling. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the question is, was it based on a true story? They said there's a lot of parallels between Anne and Ellen Montgomery's real life. Um, Ellen Montgomery actually... Uh, her her mom died when she was young, and uh, they she ended up going to live with her grandpa and her grandma. And her dad got remarried, and she didn't live with her dad after that. And so her she said she spent a lot of times on her hands and knees uh, as a punishment. Yeah. So a lot of this is, and, and she spent a lot of time imagining so that she could survive, right? To keep her sanity or whatever. Um, something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Merla's grim expression. Mellow, uh, made gentle by age or experience. Um. Well, don't cry anymore. We're not go we are we're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Will you please call me Cordelia? She said eagerly. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name. But I would love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Anne Shirley reluctantly faltered forth the owner of that name. 
oh but please do call me cordelia it can't matter much to you will you call me if i'm only gonna be here a little while can it and anne is such an unromantic name unromantic fiddlesticks this is something cool i learned fiddlesticks was the name of a violin bow but it also means nonsense so fiddlesticks are nonsense Nonsense, fiddlesticks, yep, nonsense, said the unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. At least I always have of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine, but I like Cordelia better now. But if you call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled? asked Marilla. With another rusty smile, she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer. When you hear a name pronounced, can't you always see it in your mind just as if it was printed out? I can. And A-N-N looks dreadful. But A-N-N-E looks so much disti so much more distinguished if you'll only call me Anne spelled with an e i shall try to reconcile or uh like bring back to harmony restore to friendship uh i shall try to reconcile myself to not being called cordelia very well then Anne spelled with an e can you tell us how this mistake came to be made we sent word, sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring us a boy. Were there no boys at the asylum? Oh, yes, there was an abundance of them. But Mrs. Spencer said distinctly, uh, with like clear, unmistakable, uh, Mrs. Spencer said distinctly that you wanted a girl about 11 years old. And the matron thought, that I would do. You don't know how delighted I was. I couldn't sleep at all last night for joy. Oh, she added reproachfully, uh, rebuke or criticize sharply or disapproval. Trying to Matthew, why didn't you tell me at the station that you didn't want me and leave me there? If I hadn't seen the white way of delight and the lake of shining waters, it wouldn't be so hard. What on earth does she mean? demanded Marilla, staring at Matthew. She, she's just referring to some conversation we had on the road, said Matthew hastily. I'm, I'm going to go put the mayor in, Marilla. Have tea ready when I come back. Did Mrs. Spencer bring anybody over besides you? continued Marilla when Matthew had gone out. She brought Lily Jane for herself. Lily is only five years old, and she is very beautiful. She has nut-brown hair. If I was very beautiful and had nut-brown hair, would you keep me? No, we want a boy to help Matthew on the farm. A girl would be of no use to us. Um, take off your hat. I'll lay it and your bag on the, the back table on the hall table. Anne took her hat off meekly. Meekly means not violently or strong. Um, Matthew came back presently and they sat down to supper, but Anne could not eat. In vain she nibbled at the bread and butter and pecked at the crab apple preserve. Preserve means to keep safe. So th in this case, this preserve is like jam, right? Another name for jam or jelly is preserves. So she's picking, she pecked at the crab apple jam or preserves out of the little scallop dish by her plate. She did not really make any headway at all. You're not eating anything, said Marilla sharply, eyeing her as if it were a short, serious shortcoming. Anne sighed. I can't. I'm in the depths of despair. Depths of despair means something uh, in the depths of something hopeless or desperate. Can you eat when you are in the depths of despair? 
I've never been in the depths of despair, so I can't say, responded Marilla. Weren't you, well, did you ever try to imagine you were in the depths of despair? No, I didn't. Then I don't think you can understand what it's like. It's very uncomfortable feeling indeed. When you try to eat, a lump comes right up your in your throat and you can't swallow anything. Not even if it was a chocolate caramel. I had one chocolate caramel once two years ago and it was simply delicious. I've often dreamed since then that I had a lot of chocolate caramels but I always wake up just when I'm about to eat them. I do hope you won't be offended because I can't eat. Everything is extremely nice, but still, I cannot eat. I guess she's tired, said Matthew, who hadn't spoken since his return from the barn. Best put her to bed, Marilla. Marilla had been wondering where Anne should be put to bed. She had prepared the couch in the kitchen chamber for the desired and expected boy. But although it was neat and clean, it did not seem quite the thing to put a girl in there somehow. But the spare room was out of the question for such a stray waif. So there remained only the east gable room. Gable means it's a vertical triangular end of a building. So the triangle part of a house is a gable. Gable. Um, thank you. Marilla lighted a candle and told Anne to follow her, which Anne spiritlessly did, taking her hat and carpet bag from the hall table as she passed. The hall was fearsomely clean. A, the little ga gable chamber in which she presently found herself seemed still cleaner. Marilla set the candle on the three-legged, three-cornered table and turned down the bedclothes. I suppose you have a nightgown, she questioned. Anne nodded. Yes, I have two. The matron, or a married woman, of the asylum made them for me. They're fearfully skimpy. There's never enough to go around in an asylum. So things are always skimpy, at least in a poor asylum like ours. I hate skimpy night dresses, but one can dream just as well in them as in lovely trailing ones with frills all around the neck. That's one consolidation, or that's one comfort. Yep, cons consolation is comfort. Well, undress as quick as you can and go to bed. I'll come back in a few minutes for the candle. I daren't trust you to put it out yourself. You'd likely set the place on fire. Where did she get that from? Yeah, Miss Rachel Lynde, yep. When Marilla had gone, Anne looked around her wistfully. The whitewashed, to whiten with whitewash. Um, so it's basically like it's a, it, 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 uh, like, it was kind of like paint back in the day. Yeah, it's given the description right now. You're right. Um, the whitewashed walls were so painfully bare and staring that she thought they must, must ache over their own bareness. The floor was bare, too, except for a round braided mat in the middle, such as Anne had never seen before. In one corner was the bed, a high old-fashioned one with four dark, low-churned posts. In the other corner was the aforesaid three-corner table, adorned with a fat red velvet push pin cushion, hard enough to turn the point of the most adventurous pin. So the pin cushion is so solid that if you put a pin in it, it would bend it. So it's not worth you having anymore. Above it hung a little six by eight mirror, midway between the table and the bed was the window with an icy white muslin frill over it and opposite was the white sta was the washstand so they actually had a like a pan that you could put water in and wash up and wash your hands and stuff in there 
because they didn't have running water. So this was before they had running water in the house. You'd have to go in and and uh, pump your water and bring it in. Um, the whole apartment was of uh, rigidity, rigidity or the quality or state of being rigid. So it was just rigid. Um, not to be described in words, but it, which sent a shiver to the very marrow of Anne's bones. With a sob, she hastily discarded her garments, put on a skimpy nightgown, and sprang into bed, where she buried her face downward into the pillow and pulled the clothes over her head. When Marilla came up with... For the light, various skimpy articles of raiment or clothing articles. So it's basically she's throwing her clothing around, right? Uh, scattered most untidily over the floor and a certain temptuous appearance, turbulent or stormy appearance of the bed were the only indications of a presence save her own. She deliberately picked up Anne's clothes, placed them neatly on a prim, stiffly formal and proper, uh, prim yellow chair, and then taking up the candle, went over to the bed. Good night, she said a little awkwardly, but not unkindly. Anne's white face and big eyes appeared over the bedclothes with a startling suddenness. How can you call it a good night when you know it must be the very worst night I've ever had, she said reproachfully. Then she dived down into invisibility again. Marilla went slowly down to the kitchen and proceeded to wash the supper, dish supper dishes. Matthew was smoking, a sure sign of perturbation of mind. So he's troubled in mind, feeling or showing agitation. So Matthew's troubled by the choices that they're making. What? Oh, sorry. What? Items? Oh, idioms? Idioms are an expression that has a different meaning than the meaning of its individual words. So like cloud nine, the monster love just hanging around. I'll talk about them a little bit later when we're done. Okay? Um, Marilla went slowly down to the kitchen and proceeded to wash the supper dishes. Matthew was smoking, a sure sign of retribution of mine. He seldom smoked. For Marilla set her face against it as a filthy habit. Didn't I put set her face? Put on the other page. Yep. Set her face against means she's opposing or resisting. Okay. Uh, so Marilla set her face against it, the smoking, as a filthy habit. But at certain times and seasons, he felt driven to it, and then Marilla winked at the practice, realizing that a mere man must have some vent for his emotions. Well, this is a pretty kettle of fish. It's difficult or unpleasant. She said wrathfully. Wrathfully means she's irate. She's really angry. Well, this is a pretty kettle of fish, she said wrathfully. This is what comes of sending word instead of going ourselves. Richard Spencer's folks have twisted that message somehow. One of us will have to drive over and see Mrs. Spencer tomorrow. That's certain. This girl will have to be sent back to the asylum. Yes, I suppose so, said Matthew reluctantly. You suppose so? Don't you know it? Well, now, she's a real nice little thing, Marilla. It's kind of pi a pity to send her back when she's so set on staying here. 
Matthew Cuthbert, you don't mean to say you think we ought to keep her? Marilla's astonishment could not have been greater if Matthew had expressed a predilection, a preference for something, established preference for something, for standing on his head. So she wouldn't have been, Marilla's astonishment would not have been greater if Matthew had decided, uh, expressed a preference for standing on his head. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Well, no, no, I suppose not. Not exactly, stammered Matthew uncomfortably, driven into a corner for his precise meaning. I suppose we could hardly be ex Oh, okay. Stammered Matthew uncomfortably, driven into a corner for his precise meaning. Precise means his exact or exactly meaning. Exact meaning. Um, I suppose we hardly, could hardly be expected to keep her. I should say not. What good would she be to us? We might be some good to her, said Matthew suddenly and unexpectedly. I guess they didn't want us after Okay. Um. We uh, I should say not. What good would she be to us? We might be some good to her. We might be some good to her," said Matthew suddenly, unexpect and unexpectedly. Matthew Cuthbert, I believe that child has bewitched you, controlled or affected by a magic spell. I can see as plain as plain that you want to keep her. Well, now, she's a real interesting little thing, persisted Matthew. You ought to, you should have heard her talk come, coming from the station. Oh, she can talk fast enough. I saw that at once. It's nothing in her favor, either. I don't like children who have so much to say. I don't want an orphan girl. And if I did, she isn't the style I'd pick out. There's something I don't understand about her. No, she's got to be dispatched, sent off, or away with speed. Um, oh my gosh, I've got to highlight these. Um, she's got to be dispatched right away back to where she came from. I could hire a French boy to help me, said Matthew, and she'd be company for you. I'm not suffering for company, said Marilla shortly, and I'm not going to keep her. Well, now, it's just as you say, of course, Marilla, said Matthew, rising and putting his pipe away. I'm going to bed. To bed went Matthew, and to bed, when she had put her, put her dishes away, went Marilla frowning most resolutely she's got firm determination and upstairs in the east gable a lonely heart hungry friendless child cried herself to sleep all right hang so for questions today you guys are going to be doing questions number one and two, and you know what, let's do three. Questions one, or questions one, two, and four. Um, idioms, I'm not going to make you do, but idioms would be like the depths of despair. Pretty, pretty kettle of fish. Yep, exactly. And set her face against it. All right, that's all she wrote. We'll talk to you another day. Bye.